So there's three or four different types of roles you can have. You can either work like, uh, like in the front office where you're helping teams actually improve their performance. You're advising how you know coaches, uh, like the decision making, you're telling players what to work on to actually improve their game. You also have the, the other side of working for a sports team where you're evaluating like ticket sales or things like that. Oh, okay. um, the business side. Yeah, the business side. And then you have media, right? Where it's less about improving performance and it's more about telling a really interesting story, right? You see these graphics on TVs during a football game or during a golf tournament, any of, the, any of these stats, they're out there to like engage the fans to actually bring people in and, and, and add to their understanding of the game. And then finally, you have this kind of sports betting side uh, with, again, the rise of DFS and with the, you know, the relaxation of the, the sports gambling laws. I mean, this is really going to grow in the future. This is completely about predicting outcomes, not trying to like um, improve outcomes. You're trying to just understand what happens in the most accurate way. So depending on what type of role you're in, you're going to be building very different types of models. So the mm -hmm. first one, you're going to be looking a lot at player data. You're going to be trying to understand, okay, what causes um, bad things to happen or good things to happen uh, on the field or on the court. You know, if you're looking from the media angle, you're going to be building out a lot of uh, exploratory analysis and you're going to be building a lot of visuals because I mean, frankly, everything is visual. I mean, there's, there's a reason Instagram is so popular and some of these other platforms have fallen off because we just respond so well to pictures. Right. And then for the daily fantasy stuff, it's basically all looking at and evaluating outcomes. So, you know, obviously those are three very different types of analytics, very different types of data science techniques that are used. On a more day-to-day -day basis, day -to -day basis um, it's no real different than a regular analyst or a data scientist would do. So you do a lot of data collection, you do a lot of kind of data manipulation, uh, a lot of feature engineering, which is kind of how you get the most out of these sports models. And then you're, you're doing normal model selection, feature tuning, productionization, whatever it might be. Um, and one thing that I've noticed in sports analytics is that you know, you're not always communicating information to business people or people that are, are data scientists. You're sometimes communicating to athletes or to, um, or to coaches. And, you know, these people are, are brilliant, but they just don't have as much exposure to like the language you use as right. a data scientist or a business the, Like person. the vernacular that you yeah. use. So it's really interesting to try and communicate something that is like very complex in a data science sphere to someone that hasn't had that much exposure to the field. So, you know, that is something that probably would, would behoove you if, if you wanted to get into this field to, to think about trying to um, use sports terms in a data science, data science mindset. Well, I mean, you're touching on soft skills, which is something that I feel like I've been pushing on this channel for a while and just people don't want to hear it. They don't want to like talk about soft skills and how you need to influence people and how you need to put together a compelling argument. A lot of the people I think that are attracted to analytics and data science, they, they just want to like crunch numbers and they just like want to, I, I think that they're, they're very highly intelligent, but they're also creative. So they want to like kind of build their own, their own world. And the thing about that is that it's like, it's not insulated. Like you can't build this thing and it's not communicating with the outside world at all. Yeah, well, you know, I think that there is a portion of data science and analytics where you kind of have to be a salesman. You have to get right. someone to believe in your analysis. You have to get someone to see the same things that you're seeing. And like, you know, from a business side, you usually have to convince a stakeholder to actually adopt your work, to actually use it and put it into practice. It doesn't end when you finish the analysis. It ends when it creates value for your company or for your organization. And you're not going to be useful or valuable to anyone if your, your, your product, your analysis is not getting used. You know, I see a lot of data scientists trending towards, uh, in their projects specifically, like, hey, I use this really complex algorithm. I built this, like, super advanced neural net. And that's all they'll say. They won't say, like, what the <laughs> outcomes of the project were. They won't say if they got good results, the best results with that. And it's, it's, it's all about results, especially in sports. You know, if you're... Coaches get fired if they lose, you know, 10 games a year in football, right? It's like, 
it, it is all about results and when the um loss. well you know what i think that's going on there which I, i've actually had this conversation with um uh, Jasmine O'Connell, who is, she works as a director of analytics for a medical startup here in um, the Greensboro High Point, West of Salem area. Um, she was saying that a lot of these um, analysts or data scientists that she works with, um, they see like complexity as value and them holding their weight and them feeling like proud of themselves. But a lot of times they don't have that judgment of how to apply all this like really sophisticated advanced stuff in a meaningful way yeah well you know one of my my favorite concepts it was in one of my first data science courses i, I had a really good professor and he, he told us about occam's razor are you familiar with this um wait 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 hold on i'm thinking of peter's principle or you Wait, uh, no, I, I can't come up with it. What is so, it? Occam's razor is basically the simplest approach that produces mm. roughly the same results as what you should always use. Right, it's like keep it simple, stupid. Yes, and I think that that is absolutely the most practical thing to do with data science. That's how you should be looking at every one of these problems, every one of these, uh, every one of these like data sets you're trying to tackle, mm. is you're trying to say, okay, how do I get the best results with like the simplest model? Do, you know, can I get the same results with a naive Bayes classifier as I do with a random forest? Like the complexity one on your machine for you to do naive Bayes over a random forest is like so much more simple and it, you know, uses so much less processing power, but it's also, there's so much less that can go wrong. There's so much less randomness. There's, there's all these things. Right. So you should just always be trying to focus on like, okay, like the same with communication, same with all these soft skills is that you want to give maximal impact with not the least amount of effort, but the least uh, amount of overhead.